No idea if I'm live. This isn't good. Best load Facebook. Facebook. Just checking that my streaming's working. I've got this new chat window there. Going into 15 mil. Grunt Gaming. I've been setting up a new multiple rig thing and um, so it might take me just a moment to get my coordination together. That's no good, grunts. Gaming group, loading it. 300 members, video. Huh. I'm not there. Ah, oh, someone's found me, someone's found me. Aha. Hello, Jason said he liked it. I'm going to test doing a comment now. I'm going to say hello myself, even though I've got no other people. Getting much of a comment stream through. This is not so good. I can see I'm live though. People will probably see me. I'm now going to see if I'm on YouTube. Am I on YouTube? Just checking. No chat integration. Mm. Oh, now it's working. I can see the chats across the different streams. Got two viewers. Two on, two on Facebook. Probably one of them or two of them are me. So hopefully I'm not annoying too many people by trying to set all this up because um, no one's watching anyway. Oh, there's a couple of people have ticked. Hello. Let me see if I can go into it. Ah. Dominic. Thanks for joining. I'm going to type a thanks for joining on the uh, comments um, and hopefully it will show on the screen. Thanks. Typing failure. I am not you. <laughs> exactly, Dominic. You are not me. That's handy. Uh, it's nearly working. It's only taken me two hours to get all this set up. And I'm going to close one of these windows. I'm getting confused how many windows I've got open now. But uh, I am intending to do some painting in a minute. And uh, once I've got myself coordinated, and that's why I'm looking away, I'm checking. I've got a chat window here, so if anybody types anything, I can now respond. Plus, I think it should be working on... 
YouTube too. That's good. And it's restreaming your comments to YouTube. So if you say, I'm not you here, Dom, it will go all the way up to YouTube as well. <sighs> the wonders of uh, modern technology. So I'm going to start doing something now because uh, I'm finishing the chat. So, um, right, so in this hand here, which I'm going to put over there, I have a Ground Zero Games sort of walker mecha. I started doing a paint job on this this last um, couple of nights ago and I'm going to do some more painting on it now. It's not finished. I'll be able to zoom into that shortly. Yeah, it's from Ground Zero Games UK model. And I'll put it back on the bench down there. And uh, now I'm going to switch over, so I'm just going to start painting and uh, chatting away while I do it. So anybody that joins and sees this, you're welcome to chat as well. Cheers. So there we are. First things first, um, I'm just doing this painting using these private press paints and I just need a quick palette. So I've just got an old plastic miniatures container. In fact, it had something called a phase spider in it. And just so that it doesn't get quite so badly in the way of me while I'm working, I'm cutting it down with some scissors. So miniature palette and uh, throw that away. So just a comment actually while I'm doing that, these are fantastic scissors. Um, Japanese Tritol by a company called Hasegawa. But they're actually designed for cutting um, decals, but I find them just really fine hobby modeling because you've got that big old um, hand grip. They're nice and easy to control. So anyway, if you're looking for a new pair of hobby scissors, these have lasted me for years. Tritol. Hasagawa, Japanese. Probably have to get them on import from Amazon or eBay. All right, so that's my miniature palette done. And uh, I've also got aside me all my privateer press paints in a big uh, uh, box, so I can start to use those. The other day while I was painting these, um, I was using this series of colors, underbelly blue, Crick's Bane Highlight and Crick's Bane Base. They were all uh, paints from Privateer Press, P3 paints. And yeah, they're pretty good. Uh, I also showed off this, um, I'll drop my palette now, just a moment. Right. Yeah, it's also showing off this paint from Tamiya, which is called Flat Earth X52, and I use that for all my base colors. So if you look at the basing around here, I use that on everything. Um, and one thing I also did on the last video is I took um, a look at this texture paint, which is um, a kind of crackled earth texture paint, which you can see on this model here. So what I'll do is I'll zoom in so you can start to see stuff going on there. So yeah, on this base, I put a splurge of the MIG crackle paint in here. And you can see how it's started to dry and cracked up. Because when you put it on, it's no good trying to video this because it takes about an hour to properly dry and all those little cracks to form in the textured acrylic paint. Uh, now I also have a, a finished model where I integrated that texture. And it just becomes a little bit easier to see. So yeah, on the right here, I did some washes and, and dry brushing around it just to sort of integrate the crackle texture so that it didn't stand out as much as it does on this base. But this is the first step, is just to splat some on, let it crack, and then when you're finishing the dry brushing and detailing on this base, because that's not been done yet, um, I will blend the edges of it in so it looks just like a puddle that's dried up and the mud's then cracked. And um, 
if you were just to put it on layer like that as a splat, it does stand out a bit, looks a bit unrealistic. So you want to sort of blend it once that's on. Yeah, and that stuff, I'll just get the pot of it actually. I said it was MIG, it's actually AK Interactive. Light, dry, crackle effects. And uh, once you put that stuff on, it takes about an hour or so to dry. And then you start to get the, uh, the crackle texture appearing on the base. Um, but like I said, you want to try and integrate that. The flats in those line are great. I use the flat base with Vallejo paint. What do you mean, Dom, by flats? You mean flat colours or blacks or just flat paints rather than gloss paints? Um, but anyway, AK Interactive, uh, they do a good line of uh, different diorama stuff. It's mostly for people that paint um, the sort of 1 35th scale tanks um, and they're doing proper large dioramas. So they do it in these nice big pots. So. It's actually better value buying this stuff than it would be to buy a pot from Games Workshop because you get a lot more in the pot. And they do a huge range, which I'll do some reviews of sometimes. They do these, look at this sandy desert acrylic, and that doesn't crack, but uh, it does have a nice texture to it. Um, do another video at some point and run through some of their other products. So, right, so I can get on with doing some painting now on these spider style mechs. You can see what I've done so far, so I'll do a review of what I've got to. I'll get some of this junk out of the way. I had another already done vehicle there. It's a classic thing when you're doing a video. Yeah, Tamiya flat base X21, yeah. Oh yeah, that is a good, um, it's like clear, isn't it, in a little jar. I think I might have some of that around. I definitely also use the Tamiya red uh, clear, which is like a, um, a gloss red and it's great for gore and things on metal or just a red, a red wash if you needed it. So, so far on these, get a bit of a zoom in. Um, so they're Ground Zero games. Um, it's a Mecca, 15 mil scale, yeah, clear coat. And um, all I've done is base these on washers, metal washers. I've then put some bits of stone uh, slate on there to mount them which is from my slate pot here and uh, it's just one of my sort of supplies of bits and pieces I'd use on there and then I've used a variety of bits of plastic card <coughs> and then I've dropped it but I've used a variety of bits of plastic card on here to just add extra detailing on the side and on the panels and I put a different gun mount on there the same with this one which hasn't had any highlighting done it's had additional panels and details added using styrene rod and card which i've cut to size and put on there and that's just added a bit more detail uh, it had one wash uh, wash style paint of the brown flat earth on there and that's why it's kind of broken up a bit i haven't um um you can still see the metal through there i haven't finished this base that's just sort of step one i just put it on quickly to see what it looked like and sort of bring all the colours together. I do need to paint on there again with the flat earth in addition to obviously finishing all the paintwork on the model. And uh, so what I did with the paints is I sort of went on with uh, the base at the bottom of these and the legs. That's this colour which is coal black and it's a private press colour. It's a very blue black um, and just felt like it fitted in with the theme I was after a sort of darker colour for the base that wasn't completely black but uh, had that blue to it. Then I went up with the Crick's Bane base which is also quite dark around the main hull underneath there and then the top section and the, the turret a Crick's Bane highlight and then underbelly blue just going straight on for those edge details that you can see on there which are probably a bit bright to be fair but I'm going to wash the whole thing later um, and when I do that, when I say wash, I mean uh, put a colour wash over it. In which case, um, it'll dull down some of those details. So I'm now going to just put some glazed medium into this small 
mixing palette that I cut up um, and I just mix into that. Also, I've got my handy uh, scenic spray, which I'll just put a little blob or two of water into a corner in there too. And the other thing I wanted to do, my kind of objective with this was to try and get some more, a brighter front gun area. So I might put a lot more of the underbelly blue paint color on the front, um, but I'll see how I get on with that. Um, the idea being it's kind of like just goes up highlights in a sort of sci-fi way to a brighter turret. And uh, I have my handy bit of uh, tissue paper there, always handy when you're doing this. So brush-wise, I realised I've got my older brushes in front of me, but they are Tamiya Modelling Brush Pro, size zero zero. I have a metal mount there. Zero zero is quite a fine point, which is going to allow me to do this sort of edge detailing, which I'm doing all over. So what I probably did is I went on, when I was doing this the other night, I went straight on with the underbully blue as an edge highlight for some of the areas around the base as well, and I probably just needed to go on with uh, quick Spain highlight first when I'm doing that edge panelling. Just going to use a big brush to pull some of that out. and put it in the palette. Now actually I typically use a wet palette and because I'm doing this fast and I'm on, in a small area here for the video, I'm not using my wet palette, I'm just splashing it in there, which is not ideal because the wet palette's great for keeping paint moist and, and alive for more than like 20 minutes on the, on the plastic, but uh, we'll see how I get on. So if I put all, a set of all my colours on there, get those models out of the way. So this is the underbelly blue. Slowly building that up. And just to get some of that cold black on there as well for any corrections I need to do. I know I made a mistake and went on too heavy with the underbelly blue in one area. Yeah, so these privateer press paints, they have a very fine uh, grain pigment, which means they blend really well. And I find they're really nice and opaque. Um, they're generally a good quality. So, trying to make myself some room, absolutely vital, so I don't mess up while I've got the camera zoomed in. So, right, now I'm going to get my magnifier down, which takes a moment. Yeah, this is, uh, they'll start to brighten up a little bit now because I'm putting the magnifying lights on them. So I'll start work first on the one that had a bit of some of the highlight shades on them already. Try and get things into a position where you can see them and I can see it. Actually, that may need me to just change the way the camera is just a moment. Bit of camera reorganization. Sorry about that. Just trying to get things in the right place for filming. Still, maybe just a wee bit too far over. I feel like I'm a dentist now, lining up the lights. So 
we may be in a better position now. How's that audience? Can anybody see that? How many people have I got viewing? Seem to have one person on YouTube watching. Hello, whoever's out there on YouTube. It might be me that's watching, which is probably typical. I like watch myself. Yes, so I can see straight away I made a bit of an error on the leg where that underbelly, well, not the underbelly blue, just went on a bit too heavy. So some basic correction. And then to highlight up initially, because this is really just a rush job, but to highlight up initially on the um, on the leg that's got the coal black colour, I'll go up with the Crixbane. Crixbane highlight, which is this light grey, kind of battleship grey kind of colour. And that will just enable me to sort of bring out the edge of the feet and hull, just to give it some definition. I don't know if anybody, uh, when they do painting, um, takes can take sort of 10 minutes or so to sort of get your eye in and get yourself used to your brush and your paints and things thumbs up dom thanks Yes, you hear that rattling. That's my brush in the uh, in the water. And obviously, the other thing with this is I'm usually a bit, potentially a bit quicker when I'm on my own, without the video, because I'm not um, trying to keep things in the frame. I'm only trying to keep things in my eye. You could, and some, a lot of people do this to good effect, you could just do a dry brush over this, um, which is kind of how it's getting now with this, as it gets a bit drier on the brush, because I'm still not uh, replenishing the paint and it's drying out as I do that. To be honest, what I might do now, and I quite often would, is use a slightly larger brush just because it will stay wetter for longer. This is a zero from Tamiya.
and you're really just trying to get the uh, get it right on the edge so I'm just running it over the edge changing the angle so that I can pull it pull it back and get the uh, the paint over the uh, right on the edge area it's kind of like a cheats way of painting really and I know it does take care to uh, to do edging but um, it is kind of a cheap way of painting up without doing a lot of shading and things. I wonder if the strong lights are drying the paint out a bit too quick here, but uh, yeah, it seems to be fine. So I can see another edge just there that's not uh, been highlighted up. Yeah, so when I was doing this the other day, I was rushing it a bit and uh, I went straight on with this much brighter underbelly blue along the top just to sort of show some progress. But now I'm sort of building up the highlights all over it to, uh, to add a bit more detail. Yeah, so it's bank holiday weekend here in the UK, so that means we have a, a three day weekend. May Day, May Day bank holiday. Yeah, we get a, f a few bank holidays over here at this time of year. We've got the April Easter break and then it sort of dives straight into the beginning of May with May Day. And then you get a you get one at the end of May as well. So good opportunity to do, especially if the weather's great, you don't want to go out and um, spoil your carefully developed nerd pale skin or do anything to do with your family. So obviously you don't want a perfect time to avoid any family activity as well, get inside and um, That's, that's me basically getting inside and avoiding the sunlight as much as possible. You know, in Japan, it's uh, it's actually people do generally try and avoid getting a tan. It's kind of a cultural thing that considered not it's not considered that sort of healthy way that us Westerners consider getting. Uh, a nice summer tan is something that you would do. I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. I think it's quite healthy to get the vitamin D from it. I can just see just picking out the, the bottom of its hull. Feet are nearly all done, just looking over the feet. I'm terrible for sort of bouncing around a model, but then I mentioned in the video I did the, the first one on this the other day that um, you don't need to do everything. I mean, you, I'm sort of covering everything off because I'm sort of calmly working across this, but you don't need really 
every corner of every piece, especially the behind sections that are and panels that aren't as visible. No one's going to see them. They're out of the way. And, um, you know, you give a good impression. Yeah, I think I've got the camera a bit better aligned this time. Oh, there's two people viewing on Facebook. I wonder who else is who's joined. I can't see the stream. But if you do type something in and say hello, it will appear on the screen. If you have any questions. So that's that one. And then I'll do the same sort of highlight with that Crixbane highlight on the hull. There's a kind of an edge panel again. Edge paneling even. I think I've gone onto this one before. for anybody that uh, wasn't watching the one the other day I have uh, I explained that I have a I use a magnifier from a company called Luxo that do lamps I think famously the is it Dreamworks or the Whoever it was who did all those Monsters Inc. and movies like that, they used to have feature one of those Luxo lamps kind of leaping, leaping across the screen in, in 3D. It's been going for years and years, the Luxo, but this is their, one of their magnifiers that I've got in front of me. You can't see it, but I'm looking through it at the model. And, uh, and that's because my eyesight's bad. And I could get some really powerful glasses. But it's a hell of a lot easier doing it with uh, a magnifier showing me everything as in sort of two times magnification nearly. I think it's 1.8 or something that I've got on here. Hello, Graham. I've just seen you come in. I've just started experimenting with watercolour pencils for weathering. I'm now wondering if they can, can be used to speed up edge highlighting. Yeah, I used to um, I used to have some of the... I don't have them to hand. Oh, no, I do have them to hand. Here we go, Graham. I've got instant response to you here. Tell me a weathering master. They do these in pencils as well. And uh, I used to use them on tanks and things to edge, to do edge stuff. And let's say there's a sand color in there. And what they provide you with is a makeup style application. But essentially this is the same as the stuff they do in pencils. Um, and you can get some on the the tip. And you can edge with it. Likewise, you could do it with a pencil. Obviously, it's a big fudgy looking stick thing. But watch as I do this. It's a bit crumbly, actually. Might be because this is so old. But it is sort of doing the edge. And the pencils work in a similar way. But the problem is, um, and this happened to me with the, the pencil method, because I use the silver pencils, um, which are fantastic for doing um, 
uh, a very, where is it, where is one? Here's a silver pencil. I think it's a silver pencil. No, it's not. But there's, a, there's silver pencils you can get as well, which are great for doing tank tracks. Oh, and there's the, uh, there's another one of those Tamiya things that they do. That's the same stuff, essentially, in a stick form that would also allow you to draw on using the stick along the edge. You get a sort of edge. It's not great. You can rub it down. You do get little bits sticking out of it. But the point I was going to make, with all the pencil stuff uh, that you can get, and these pigments, when you use it, it will, and if you do a dull coat with any form of um, spray, it will dissolve it. So I did some fantastic work once on some 15 mil tanks using uh, weathering pencils. I used some of this, and I even used some chalks and things, and then I sprayed dull coat on, and it just dissolves it. So, warning there. If you're gonna use those, do them after you've done a dull coat, so get all your primary base coats on and then come back. Um, but yes, no doubt you can. You, you could use them. Maybe you could also try um, just rubbing those bits off there a little bit. Um, it is water dissolvable, but also it's sort of dissolvable by dull coat too, spray dull coat aerosol will dissolve pencil and chalk and weathering pigments as well actually that's why you should seal your weathering pigments if you use the dust pigments these ones just sort of throwing out some tips while i'm at it mig and various other companies do these pigments they're just like a dust a fine dust and they because they don't have any bonding agents or any other paint acrylic in them they are just the powder and I use those to do bits on bases and things to sort of weather them. But just like the chalks and other bits and pieces, because they've got no aid bonding agent, if you don't mix them with something to seal them, they do a great job of just dissolving away when you spray an aerosol or anything on them at the end. Um, or even if you just were to drool on them or something, they would uh, start to come off unless you used... I don't know, I would use, um, and I have used some of this glaze medium before with pigments to seal them on. Um, which is, you just mix them into that, that makes them wet rather than using water. But yeah, you'd get, you'd get faster edging. And I normally go faster, to be fair, when I'm not uh, trying to also keep everything in the, uh, in the camera here. And just while I'm sort of chatting away. Yeah, so earlier on today, I had um, about 10 aborted attempts to, to go online because I was setting up this thing called Restream. It's kind of like a free service. But what it does is allows you to stream to multiple. So I can go to YouTube and Facebook at the same time. Just check I've still got a stream and I'm painting. Yeah, I think it's nearly in focus as well. The reason for that is, is I've got quite a considered rig of gear cameras and things that I've set up from about 10 years of doing videos started out doing you know basic handy cam stuff um, and then uploading it from a Panasonic you know, video camera that happened to do happened to save onto memory card in a format that you could upload so I used to use that and then Things moved on, and I've got streaming gear now. But Facebook doesn't let you stream to more than one service. All these other providers, like YouTube, which is you know one of the biggest players out there, allows you to stream to YouTube and 
anything else like Twitch or any of these other platforms. But uh, Facebook um, block it. So they say, well, if you want to put your video content on our platform, you're not allowed to stream anywhere else at the same time. And if they spot it, they'll block your stream and they can see it. I don't know how they see it, but the way you configure the system. So I've made an error there. Oh, my paint's drying off here, unfortunately. Yeah, I may have to consider making like a really mini wet palette. Just tidying up where I can see. Gone on too heavy. But that paint's a bit blobby now. Yeah, so uh, Facebook don't let you stream live when you're trying to stream somewhere else at the same time. Just messing around with a palette, putting bits of paint around and water. Yes, yeah, so if you're still listening, Graham, watercolour pencils will be dissolved by your um, dull coat if you do spray with a dull coat, um, unless you seal them somehow first. Yeah, so I just noticed I haven't done anything on that leg. Yeah, so anyway, I found this service called Restreaming.io and um, they allow you to stream to Facebook and YouTube and things at the same time by doing some kind of bypass trick. It's one of those things again, isn't it? The world's made of these um, technical limitations. It's one of the reasons I hate Outlook. Um, not just because of uh, the fact it's remained stagnant for 20 years with very little automation, just a few rules and things. Um, also because technical limitations are built in so, for commercial reasons. So with Outlook, for example, they want you to get SharePoint for any of the groovy features. And uh, obviously Facebook want to prevent, I don't know, 70% of their users that would stream to them that aren't fully technically savvy that will go and look and find a service that will bypass it. Uh, they want to prevent those people from streaming elsewhere and make it more hassle so that the content stays fresh just for um oops that was badly done just for their own network and not being broadcast elsewhere i can understand it i mean that's how the world works doesn't it really i mean they have to make money off something and why not do that by just like the, the major networks for TV and video and film block things into their own networks exclusive to this network or what have you. But I think the lines are blurring on that now. I mean, I watched something on BBC in the UK and then two weeks later I'm seeing it presented on Amazon or Sky it's this, this big blurred amount of content. It'd be great actually if they had some sort of technology that said filter. You know, understand what my services are if you use Amazon Prime, YouTube, Netflix, BBC iPlayer, and only show me. 
only show me the stuff that I've got one that I've got access to in one place. So it'd have to be a sort of intelligence service, wouldn't it? That went, oh, okay, I can see you've got iPlayer, so you don't need, when you're in Amazon, I'll switch off anything that was presented from the BBC that's still available on iPlayer. It would just reduce your just quagmire of massed streaming services down a bit. Also, I don't think they really got me yet in terms of knowing knowing what you like. I don't know if anybody's... You know, obviously I like military programs, history, technology. There doesn't seem to be any way across most of these streaming services to sort of make that presentable. They're trying to do it intelligently. They're sort of, oh, I can see you watched Band of Brothers or War in the Pacific and therefore you might like something else. But they haven't got the sort of, they haven't got a a page where you could say, oh, I really like this kind of content. Oh, wouldn't it be great to be able to block? I mean, that's got to come. You know, I don't want Coronation Street, EastEnders, Casualty. Just never show me it again, ever. It's getting close to that. You'll never have to watch it again. So yeah, I've now got the underbelly blue and I'm sort of speeding up. I've got my eye in. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, that after a while you can speed up because your hand-eye coordination sort of starts to work. You still make mistakes. Just because this is new, I'm just going to go over to Facebook and just see that it still is streaming. Ah, I can see a load of people have joined. Oh, Helen Logan, Duncan Gosling, Christopher Tyson, Eric. A Russian-style name, sorry I can't pronounce it, you might be Hungarian. And Steve, Tim Jim, thanks for joining. Do write a comment on, because I'm excited that I've got comment streaming coming in now. So um, if people do say something, I will see it like a hello or something. Or how did you do that? Or stop going on about BBC streaming services. I don't want to hear your, your junk. Now I'm going to go on about that again. And that's, um, they're all doing it now, BBC, Sky, the lot. They're putting adverts at the beginning of a streaming song. So if you're watching Game of Thrones, you get some crappy advert for another. You know, it's only their content. They're not showing you an advert for a car or anything, but they are showing you content that you're not selecting. And it seems to be a new trend. And I don't like it. You know, when I hit play on Game of Thrones, I don't want an advert for some other Sky Atlantic thing coming soon. And BBC are doing it as well on iPlayer. You get you get streamed some other stuff that I've yet to have it stream something worthwhile that you know go oh actually I haven't, I've missed that that would be great to watch that's not happened. Yes, I don't know how interesting people are finding me doing this edge panelling live. But you can see how I'm sort of working along, building up the, uh, the paint, making the odd mistake.
Uh, Roderick, hello. Just seeing your name pop up there. I mean, most people probably just come in, don't they, for a second and glance and go, oh my goodness, just doing that. I'm, uh, I'm on my phone, sat in the pub somewhere, or maybe watching some TV, thinking about going out to mow the lawn. And uh, you see this, it's not that exciting, but uh, you know, if you are interested in seeing something slowly painted into a finished article, Yeah, so I must admit what I'm doing is I am jumping, jumping in between the colors. So I might jump to do the underbelly blue section, which is this highlight, super highlighted blue. And then if I see that I've missed something earlier, I'll jump back to it. And slowly it sort of brings everything into focus on the model. The other thing you can do is um, it's not it's not really cell shading, but you can obviously do just one brighter full panel, like you might go on the side here. Might need a couple of couple of coats, but the odd brighter full section So I haven't gone to see Endgame yet. That's um, something I'd like to see. I nearly went last night, but I was feeling a bit unwell. So three hours in a cinema wouldn't have been great. But I did watch Game of Thrones last week. I won't say any spoilers because it could be people watching it, but it was it was pretty good big battle scene you know I was on the edge of my seat I was really really drawn into it and you know watching the characters you kind of almost watch the characters grow up from the beginning of the series so that's quite good fun something has gone on for so long and no adverts as well which is great they do have the advert breaks, but obviously we're in the UK and if I'm watching it on Sky Atlantic, I don't, don't get any adverts blasted at me.
people were talking about adverts in in the, in the office the other day because I don't watch them anymore. It's uh, you know I am missing out. I think. And then we have an insurance sales thing called Go Compare that compares different rip off insurance services in the UK, and there is an advert for that. And someone mentioned that, and I shamelessly I I went oh I know that, and even started to sing the the song. But I think that was from an era when uh, a few years ago when we were just sort of. I was moving over to not reusing any ter terrestrial TV and just have streaming services. So it was kind of the last period of time that I was going to get uh, hit by advertising. It's raining heavily in Crawley. We had an earthquake here last night. Um, it's the third earthquake we've had, and I experienced the last, in the last year, I experienced the last one and the one last night. And um, I've got a house with a very old roof. Um, well, it's just quite a modern house, but the, the roof was made from... Um, sort of vintage clay cast fire hand fired tiles and they're very small and kind of creak and uh, so now I'm very familiar with the earthquake because what it sounds like is just above my bed it sounds like a grown adult male could be femur could be a superhero size could be a large person of any sex I jumped onto my roof like a spider girl, man. And um, the first time it happened, my wife and I leapt up because we thought, and I went into attack mode, ran for the golf club, couldn't remember where it was, ran downstairs, opened the front door. Who the hell's jumped onto the house? Like kids that decided to climb the house from the fence and climb up. And uh, it wasn't, <coughs> it wasn't kids, it was just, uh, it was the earthquake. And last night, in addition, it was at 1.20 a.m. last night in Sussex in the UK, the earthquake. And last night, it also rattled a cup I had on the side. So I immediately know, ah, oh, don't worry, someone hasn't just leapt onto my roof. Because my cup's rattling as well in Jurassic Park style, gave me early warning. Yeah, so if you've joined later, these are Ground Zero games, 15 mil sci-fi mecha models. And uh, I added extra plastic card details to them. I've mounted them on washers. And um, I'm just painting the highlighted details on now. They will get a kind of a color wash as well. So this one hasn't had quite as much of the highlight along the top of the color called Underbelly Blue from Privateer Press. So Interesting enough, I noticed an old friend on Facebook because, of course, I'm streaming to Facebook now as well as um, YouTube, which means that it's not just my nerd geeky friends that are seeing this. It's uh, social friends and work friends if they want to watch this can and uh, find out what I do in my own time. However, um, one of the friends, Helen, I saw it said connected earlier. I used to work with Helen and we were in California in a hotel for a business 
training course on a network CD-ROM solution back in mid, early to mid nineties. And um, I was reading a book and I nearly, I can nearly remember the name of the book. I can't quite in the hotel, you know, that sort of thing. You finish the course, went back to the hotel room, planning to go out for something to eat later. I was reading my book on the bed, relaxing, probably a bit jet lagged. And uh, and suddenly it felt like someone had grabbed the headboard and was slamming it against my head. And I thought someone was attacking, like I did with the house here, thinking that a man had or a woman had jumped on the top of the house when the earthquake went off and uh, leapt up, ran down to reception. And so did Helen and we both said to the receptionist, oh, what's going on, emergency? And the receptionist just said coolly, oh, it happens all the time. It was just a small one and uh, the hotel's on wheels, so don't worry about it. Obviously, in Japan, that also has earthquakes. They put uh, all those old wooden temples, you see, and you think, how come they're staying up for thousands of years or hundreds of years, these wooden buildings? They, they, make, they don't use nails, but they use pegs and wood, but they also place round stones under all the columns. All the key structural areas on those old buildings have round stones, if you look at the base of any columns on their temples and uh, it allows the whole structure to roll on the columns. So, interestingly, I've experienced now, obviously, I had also visited Japan, and I was in the bathroom of the hotel when there was an earthquake as well there in Tokyo. And that scared me and also felt like, um, unlike the quick tremor here and in California, it felt um, like I was seasick. The whole room sort of rolled. And you get this sort of sensation where you, it's almost like you do think you're at sea. Of course, the other big fault line in the US is in uh, along sort of Memphis, the sort of central, I don't know what it's called, but it's a central fault. If you ever go to somewhere like Memphis, they've the buildings are very low, and there's probably a good reason for it because of the potential for a big quake there. But I was in a mall there when I, I felt a slight tremor. Everything sort of moved. Could have just been hung over though. I didn't actually, that's the one earthquake I didn't get any kind of, no, no one said afterwards, oh yeah, that was an earthquake. Yeah, so the weapons on the front of these, I added detail to with bits of plastic card, which I'll show you just for a moment. Yeah, it's lots of little strips. So I do two things on the bases these days. I often use small bits of clipped plastic card, which give you base makes it look like you've got sort of old cracked concrete and things on the base. And uh, my friend Jonathan Rogers, who does a lot of good painting, gave me that sort of idea to put this on a base. So you'll often see that. So 
So on the edge of these models here, it's got sort of larger bits of plastic card sort of stuck into there. And then when it's all painted up, it looks like a bit of con broken concrete or broken earth. It allows you to kind of get away with doing a base that's semi-urban, semi-rural. So you could say, oh, that's um, rubble from destroyed buildings and things, but equally you could uh, um, just say it's just sort of rural rubble and rock as well. So it kind of makes the base multi-use. And then this very tiny cork tray, which I use to put these um, plastic card bits in. These are the sort of things I've added to the front of that gun and other bits and pieces and details on those mechs that I'm just painting now. So you can see a kind of half cylinder type piece of rod, um, straight sections, tiny hex shapes, tiny little um, bits and pieces really. And if you add those on, glue those on before you've painted, like one of these guys, they start to uh, Adds a little bit more extra extra detail. Obviously, it's a bit fussy to do gluing them on, but they go on okay. And one thing I'll mention actually on glue: when I glue them on, I actually use Mod Podge, which is like a white glue, and um, it sort of gets tacky, so it allows you to sort of move it around. But the main reason I use it is because I'm. Over the years, I've become a bit intolerant to this sort of super glue stuff, which I still use for doing the main gluing of a model, if it's got limbs and things, because you need some strength on the bond. Um, but I, you know, I leave windows open. I go to loads of a long-winded method of trying to make sure I get as much air around me, and then I'll put glue, slowly um, curing glued models, well away from me by a window, open window. Um, because I find if I use super glue and then the next day I'll, if I've been breathing a lot of it in, I'll feel like I've got a cold for like two or three days sometimes. So I don't like it. It kind of flushes my sinuses through, which might be a good or a bad thing. I don't know. The Victorians used to take those pills, didn't they? They would, f it's kind of like a little metal pill that they'd eat. I can't remember what it was made of, but it would um, flush their, um, Stomach. I mean, basically, it would expel just about everything from their body from both ends. Um, and they saw it as a good thing. It was kind of, oh, well, actually, if you've got any stomach ailment, take one of these. And they'd use it multiple times, obviously give it a quick wash, a magic pill. And um, the end result, of course, is that um, just about everything in their stomach contents and gut would be expelled one way or another. It wasn't a nice experience, but they considered it a good thing to expel stuff. Magnesium, was it or something? I, don't know. I can't remember. It was some kind of material. Anyway, that's what super glue does to my nasal passage. I start to feel like I've got a cold. So whenever I can, if I find another glue that works and the model stays in one piece, I will use it instead of super glue because super glue is filth in terms of the stuff going into you. I don't like it. So I'm building up now the um, this underbelly blue by covering some more of the surface up here. And I'm starting to get that result I was after, which was a slightly whiter turret, so that um, essentially going from the legs, the dark colour, right up to a mid-tone in the, in the main hull, and then the, the gun turret will be nearly white. 
So I'll, I'll use some white on the edges of the um, of the gun to really highlight it up. So when I was on that California business trip, we also we rented a like a Cadillac. It was like one of those old school things that would uh, it was just for fun really, rather than you know getting the compact car. Um, put it on that company expenses. Probably got into trouble for that. But um, it was this massive white Cadillac, and I just remember it had it was the first time I'd encountered because obviously the UK trails behind US car features by well back then in the 90s it was trailing by more than 10 years so you know, nearly 20 years you know back in the early 90s it was rare to have aircon in a in a European car even rarer to have a, a gauge on the dashboard that showed you your petrol consumption and that's what this Cadillac had. And I remember going up a hill, you put your foot down and you get about one mile per one mile per gallon out of it. It was a monster. Hi Jamie, glad that you're getting some motivation. Yeah, I'm just doing some Saturday afternoon painting. And earlier on I was saying, Oh hi Craig, thanks thanks for checking in. Craig Grady. And uh, I can't remember what I was saying now. I've just gone and said hello to people. Oh, terrible. How to tidy the whole room to install new windows. Getting the itch to sit at the workbench. Yeah, that's a good plan. When you say windows, James, do you mean house windows or Windows version? 20 or something on your computer, that's what I want to know. Yeah, new house windows. Wow, that's dollars. What did you go for? Triple glazed or double? There's some Scandinavian countries that do, you know, sort of five layers of glazing and stuff. Um, the UK was mostly double glazing. We probably need to up that really for energy efficiency reasons. Oh, new house, that's nice. Are you in the US then? Are you whereabouts are you? Double gas field, shaded, nice. So what I'm doing here um, at the moment is I've taken the mid-tone grey and just because I've got my eye in now and I'm settled in to doing this, I'm just going back and using a bit of the um, glaze medium. So I'll repeat that stuff, glaze medium, show that again, glaze medium. Using that and some of the mid-tone to just bring down some of the highlights I've done and, and blend them a bit. I mean, I normally wouldn't spend an awful lot of time doing that on a small mecha like this. I mean, why go to that level? But... Uh, you know, I'm just doing that, sort of blending them in, the highlights, so that they don't look as sharp. Oh, 
Oh, I need a handbrake nearly now. Oh. Anyway, the reason I mentioned that white Cadillac uh, in America on that business trip is that, uh, and we were, where were we? Was it LA? I can't remember, it was the 90s, but we, uh, drove out to the desert in this massive white Cadillac old school gas guzzler and uh, I did wheel spins, it was a hire car. Took it off road, well, I want to say off road to a desert track. Huey style dropships are still waiting for me to finish them. Yeah, who's, who's Huey style dropships are those then? Are those... Um, Kurosan ones, because they have that kind of look. Or those self kits you've done yourself. So I'm going to pick the other one up now. Rebel Miniatures. Yeah, yeah, I think I've seen those. They're nice. Are you going to airbrush those or paint them? Ah, oh, converted with open sides. Yeah, they're nice with the gunners hanging out. Always adds a bit of uh, detail. I think Brigade Models and uh, Ground Zero Games, they both do nice... Um, Gunner kind of crew models now. That way you can sort of see them hanging out of the side of the uh, of the gun, of the uh, helicopter. Airbrush, yeah, yeah, good stuff. I have a. Uh, have a Huey story and that's because the company that I was working for way back in the 90s were um, American and we did a lot of stuff for military spare parts supply but when I say we didn't handle military spare parts but we uh, provided a software platform that allowed people to trade and identify spare parts there's this phrase in military construct um, manufacturing called NHA, which means uh, next higher assembly. The idea being that is if you've got a cruise missile and you had the NHA guide for it, you could always know what the next highest component was. So if you started with a nut in front of you on the floor, you could, although that's an extreme example, you can build up. an entire cruise missile by looking at whatever the next higher assembly is. So it was like a, a nut goes into a board and had to be of a certain specification, otherwise it, under stress it would fall apart. And then that would go onto a, a motherboard or something or a control system. And uh, so there's vast databases of those that I used to get involved with uh, selling to people that were maintaining military systems. And the reason I was talking about this is that I worked with a guy, he's now retired, but he was a Vietnam War helicopter pilot, and then he was a helicopter pilot trainer in Vietnam. And I worked with him for about two or three years. But, um, he had two or three different good, very interesting stories of um, 
crashing, basically. Here is and one of them where his co-pilot was behind him and they had their gear hit by a lone sort of rifleman on the ground. The rotor gears and hot streaming oil came down into the cockpit from where it was hit and poured down over the head and face. Well, he had a helmet on, but over the face and neck uh, or back of the neck, I think it was, of the uh, co-pilot. Anyway, Don, who was piloting, kept turning round and he was, said he was in the clearest of fields ever, flying quite low, kept having to turn back to look because this guy was sort of screaming and shouting because he had burning hot oil on him. And... Uh, Turned back round and there was a tree right in front of him. Smash, they went down. And um, he said the, they rolled. And he said everything came off, the, the, the tail, the rotors, everything. And they kept rolling around and around. I didn't know where he was, completely disorientated. And he said amazingly, they both just stood up afterwards, um, climbed out of what was the shell and neither of them were injured, apart from obviously the burn on his co-pilot. And, um, yeah, just fascinating story. Then they just ran. And they were near the, wherever they were, they were near a safer zone. They were on the return from a, a mission of some kind, so they weren't um, stuck out for long wherever they were. But he couldn't believe it. He said he couldn't believe that they survived without any further injury from, from that crash. So he would retell the story. In fact, he ended his career in, well, his military career actively out in Vietnam. He ended it doing the uh, quite a sad sort of well, emotional job of doing the sort of repatriation of dead dead soldiers. And he's, his job was writing to families with a telegram with the bad news and dealing with the sort of bodies and things, which is extremely sort of sad. But he, uh, he said they had special training to be able to write such a terrible piece of news in a sort of clean and respectful sort of way, but also no wastage because they had such a small amount of text to be able to write in for the sort of telegram or whatever they were, systems they were using. So yeah, so they had to be as conservative as possible, I remember him saying, uh, with the what they wrote. So I've gone quiet now, I've nearly run out of conversation. Someone needs to ask me a question if there's anybody left watching. I'm nearly over this phase though, I'm nearly done. Just see that that's still in focus. So I mean, really, they're done. To be fair, um, 
trying to stop saying to be fair. But there, I'm done. As far as the sort of main paint. I think I did say I wanted to go lighter on the on the guns. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to get a white. I think I've got a white somewhere to hand. Yep, right there. Shaking the white pot. So size-wise, you can see them. This is brigade models. Some infantry there. That's in their Polish infantry, which I think were armies, armies originally. And um, you can see how big they are against the 15 mil scale. Move them over a bit. Oh yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, they're turning out quite good, I hope. Um, still plenty more to do to sort of finish them off. On the bases as well. So I've just give, got some private press white out. Moro white, they call it, that's just white. Yeah, as I said, I haven't finished the bases or anything on these. They're just still, just got the main primary color that I put on there, which is this X52 flat earth, which I use Tamiya paint for the bases. So I've got some white on the brush now. Which is even more extreme highlight on the underbelly blue on this front of this weapon. I'm probably going to do a little red light or something on the front there where I've put a small disc. I paint it white first though because uh, red needs a kind of a white base to go on nice to give it any kind of brightness. Yeah, so only the gun am I going to do any of this sort of more extreme highlighting. Just check, I don't think I'm in focus. I'm still using some of the um, glaze medium mixed in with the white just to makes it slightly more transparent and just blends a little bit better in with the uh, goes on a bit smoother blends in a bit easier Here's Craig. Hey Robin, I'm seeing you are multi-basing more infantry. Is this becoming more of a thing in version 2? It is, it is. Um, we've worked really hard to have come up with a method, which I'm not going into all the details on yet because we're still playtesting it, but um, 
we've got it working quite well now, the game, the version 2, um, with both single bass and group bass. And it's quite interesting how we've done it, but I won't tell you now. Um, I'm waiting to do sort of a bit more of a reveal to to a play play test group, but um, yeah, it's going to be multi bass and um, and single bass. Your choice, which seems quite surprising. That you, how would you get those two things working together? But we've come up with something, and so far it's feeling quite quite good. Um, but to, uh, squad leaders like this group here. So picking something up. There's a little infantry group. Squad leaders are still separately based. So you don't have a command base and then a squad base. So that would be actually a squad of four and a squad leader separately. And obviously in Grunt's squad leaders were all um, um, quite key to the game and they still are in that they're the kind of the last one to die. They're kind of like an abstract kind of leader of the squad. So that's a squad of four. And then it's we've done it in increments of four. So you have a squad of four, eight, and 12. But you don't need to rebase. You can get away with it still with uh, single bases as well. So now I'm into the realms of experimentation with these two because I wanted to put a I wanted to put a, a yellow stripe around the front weapon around the weapon. And I don't know how I'm going to do it. Might just paint it on and just see how it works out. So I've got Signar Yellow. Yeah, but the group basing still makes it, I think people are always a bit nervous because they kind of like the idea, and I did, this is why I did grunts. I like the idea that I could use terrain in a kind of very fine way and hide behind things with single bases and that felt kind of almost like the 28 mil scale gaming down into 15 mil you still retained that sense of it being a sort of skirmish um, but um, given how nearly all companies produce things in squad packs and they're quite fine and small and also for a quick game individually picking up the models just takes a long time um, we decided to go for group bases. But with that option to play with single as well. I mean, it always already written in group rules, actually, into grunts. And that's, I mean, it's one of those things, isn't it, that um, that's a frustration as a designer that you do stuff and people don't necessarily um, realize you've done it in your rules that you'll get uh, some assumptions made from some people oh grunts that's a single small skirmish game I, I don't like that i want to you know as a player you might want a larger game and say oh i, I can never get on with that all my models are based as groups but actually we did build in group basing with all the rules for how um, using shooting from them and how cover would work with a group base as well. So um, yeah, it's in there. It's in Grunt's version one already, but it, it wasn't as it wasn't as detailed as it could be. Although it would work um, and we tried it. And, and just as we're trying it now, we're now trying it with the group bases mixed in with the single bases. Yeah, tight quarters, it gets a bit cumbersome. 
that that's where we we think we've worked it out with how we interact with the squad leader now for cover and things so anyway we're hoping it uh, it works out for us but at the same time when i'm building my terrain i'm, I'm now looking at not just what a small base would go on but i'm trying to make it playable for a large base as well You know, how could you fit a, a large group base onto a bit of terrain to make it uh, fun to play with as well? So you know what, I think, I think what that yellow needs is it needs a dark grey. Um, perhaps if I keep it in tune with the rest of the model, I'll just use the, the existing cold black on there. Now feeling I've got a few too many things in my way. I'm going to drop this paint sometime. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to have a dark patch directly behind it. Oh, there's too much paint. Schoolboy error. Too heavily laden brush. Tidying up required. You're getting a nice sharp line between two different tones of colour can be uh, difficult, especially on a big uneven surface like this because there's curves. Yeah, maybe I could do a bit of orange on there too. Is it your birthday, Craig? Is it your birthday yesterday? So happy birthday. I think I might have seen that on Facebook. Yeah, I've got an orange. I'm going to try that. I've got. No, that's not very orange. That's a good orange. Did you make it down to salute then, Craig, this year for the big show? Didn't see you, but uh, I was uh, sort of head down, sort of filming things, wandering around in my neck and back and carrying heavy stuff. A word of warning on my uh, Facebook birthday. It's not my real birthday. I just put a fake one in there years ago. And I would say it's because I'm a conspiracy theorist that wants to protect myself on every platform, but I don't... I don't uh, put a fake birthday in everywhere, but uh, I did in Facebook, and I thought I'll just use it as like a royal birthday. You know, I think the royals, don't they have like a fake birthday that's their royal birthday, and then the real one as well. So I say things like this, it's a case of building up as well, because it's on the side there, it's not that strong. If 
if you go on thin, you then want to come back and uh, highlight it up. So I'm a big fan of the, the sort of 80s and 70s and 80s style sci-fi where all the ships and spaceships and things are um, are very bright blacks and there was a computer game called Homeworld that used it in all of their ships, sort of very bright colours, very sci-fi. Yeah, so what I'm saying is I get thousands of people on Facebook that say, happy birthday, and uh, it's not my birthday. And I was at a, a job that I'd started and uh, didn't know anybody, and they all checked my Facebook, and they got me a cake and a card and everything by checking my Facebook out. And obviously I had it and didn't tell them. Oh, you still have Homeworld in the original box, yeah. Now, that's another link to Grunt's my game as well, actually, that um, in Homeworld, there's this sort of star map. And it's very nice. Uh, I don't know, it looks like um, uh, Battletech used to have maps of their solar system as well, and it uh, was very nice design and colour. Almost vector sort of colours and things on the map. You, know, you can imagine zooming in and out of it on a 3D screen or something. Anyway, I wanted the same thing for Grunts, and I found a guy that uh, on DeviantArt or somewhere, and he was like one of these long supporters. I think he was Scandinavian. He was a long-time supporter of Homeworld. As over the years, obviously, it went well out of date. And I think there was a Homeworld 2 eventually. Uh, but he, he was one of these people keeping the fire burning for it as a game system. And I think people were trying to sort of do levels or expand it by like public, in the public domain rather than waiting for a new version which sort of never came. And um, he used to do the maps for it. Um, so they weren't official for the game, but he had mastered doing the maps exactly like they are in Homeworld. And he kindly agreed to do one for um, for Grunts, so the map in Grunts, which is also downloadable as a PDF if you buy the game online, um, is done in the Homeworld style. And then I had another person called Aris, who's on the 15 mil. Aris Coleman, he did the logos for me. Logos, I mean, faction symbols, I think is the proper better word for it. And um, I overlaid those onto the star map. Oh, look at that, far too much water on there. What a mess. Luckily, it was in a kind of an edge that didn't matter. Suck that bad off, back off with the brush. So yeah, that's not too bad. Um, it's not looking too bad. I mean, it's looking interesting. I do like some. I know, and it's not. It's not um, military, is it? To have something that looks really bright, you want something as dull and black and neutral as possible. That's not picking up any. Um, not reflecting any light and shining on the battlefield, but I, I like the sci-fi feel to it. Actually, I do wonder if there is a point in time in history where military equipment will go back to being bright because sensors and detectors will be so um, intelligent that people will say there is no reason to paint the camo on anything. Obviously, 
it always feels like there would be because a soldier with his eyesight would um, would see something in the distance compared to a sensor. But potentially even soldiers with augmented eyesight in 100 years' time will... Um, yeah, a dark wash. I'm going to do a dark wash on there for sure. Um, yeah, augmented soldiers in the future will have some sort of eyesight boost or sensors built in. They'll never... I know they've probably got it already, to be fair, most of them. Uh, what modern armies they do wear the sort of visors and goggles and heads up displays and uh, they will never need to know visually that something's hidden behind a bush with camo because it's just always going to be on the heads up display which means that supports my complete wild theory that vehicles will suddenly be painted really brightly uh, without camo because they'll They'll paint them in some sort of fantastic way, like the World War One, you know, Red Barons and fighters, where they were really more painted up to sort of highlight their um, the sort of fear factor or notoriety. That's the word I was looking for. You saw that red aircraft, and you go, "Oh my goodness, it's the Red Baron," which means I'm going to get. Uh, Knocked out of the sky. There are actually, um, I can't remember what they're called, but I was following it on the BBC. There was a um, group of African modern fighters, sort of AK-47 cat wielding sold mercenary soldiers. And they, rather than wearing camo, it's a kind of fear thing. They wear bright, they wear like dresses and bright headscarves and things to strike sort of fear into the hearts of those they see. And apparently the brighter and more wild they look, the more they believe, at least, it defends them against bullets. Clown cars are the future, definitely. <laughs> Miss Krusty the Crown. And... Uh, yeah, they've got that belief anyway that uh, the brighter they are and the more visible, the more fear they'll strike into the hearts of their enemies with their pink feather scarves. I thought it would make an interesting army for a game anyway. You know, AK-47 sort of African with a sort of Nissan trucks or what have you, technicals with machine guns in the back and guys with clown gear on. Not the most perfect of stripes, but it's going a bit sideways. It's interesting to me that... Um, when you have an idea like this and say, I was just experimenting, I thought I'd just do a stripe and a colour on the front, you uh, suddenly find you're painting this one section for like half an hour to an hour and realise, oh, hang on a minute, I did the rest of the model in 20 minutes, what's going on here? Still drying, not good. At least I can get my line in there. Where's that orange for the front? Well, you may have noticed anyway, you probably don't because I'm jumping between the models, but these um, I used. Um, different weapons, different gun things for the turrets that I found us in the bits box. Looking a bit shiny. It's 
So I'm okay with that, really. So, you know, they're less than perfect, but they're only small things. Tabletop standard, isn't it, really? You don't want to go too far with them. I, I will tidy that of that stripe, because it's annoying me that uh, the... Uh, darker colour was not dry enough to take the yellow. Do need to leave that alone, I think I'd let it dry for a bit. I was hiding there while I was painting. That's a good way of doing it. Look, magic of painting. I'm actually watching back because my the stream's about uh, 10 seconds or so, I think, behind me. So I can actually go back and watch whilst uh, and uh, talk over it. Um, yeah, it's looking okay. I wonder another thing might be just a really... Uh, <laughs> A fine black line. Let's do it. I feel like I should do it, so I'm going to do it. You know what I first wanted for the for the yellow? I wanted it to be on like a darker grey, and I wanted the yellow to look that way that um, paint does when it's chipping off. I'm just messing around with my brush to get the fine, a very fine point on it without too much water, otherwise it's going to splash over everything. Yeah, so finish off the stripe with a little black line along the front. That'll do, I think. if I was airbrushing I'd mask it as well um, you know how it is like this project was meant to be just I saw these in an old box they were eight years old and I painted them before and not really given them any uh, proper attention and then I thought hang on no, I'll just add some extra bits and guns on the front of them and then before I know it, I'm doing a video of them and probably could have spent more time doing it properly with an airbrush, but so uh, there you go. Just went over the edge there a bit.
So shall I do a wash on them now? Black paint that's applied with blister sponge. Yeah, that's blister sponge. Yeah, a blister sponge would be good. Um, yeah, that kind of uh, way that you do um, kind of a slight sponging for rust or something could work. Now I'm looking back here, I think that can now have an extra bit of yellow painted on to try and fill in the gaps. Yeah, definitely some more yellow in that bottom bit. some black in the end of the barrel bits there. So, washes, so what will I do? Well, I think the kind of a bluey green thing going on. I've got this burned olive green. I've also got a black, a black gray. Um, I'll shake them up. Yeah, let it dry. That's the problem, isn't it, when you're, um, you just keep layering on when you're on a video like this. So black gray may be over the, lighter top go straight on with a big brush these are by a company called life color and they they call them adjustable because you can put them on and then later on you can take it off a bit as well oops so i'm going to splash that all on if it's a problem it's a problem but let's let's see experienced talks that I've used it before and I know that I can just sort of splash it all over. You know when you're applying a a wash like this, you can just be quite uh, generous with a big brush, etc. And that will just take the sort of harshness out of some of the highlights on there as well, really. It's um in the, uh, um, Craig will know this, but in the in the military modelling painting world, they sort of, they call them filters uh, rather than washes, because the filter will bring in a single colour uh, across the whole area. And also, if you're military modelling, you don't um, You're not after these harsh highlights like I'm doing here, so like a filter bringing the tone together across a full area on a model is very useful. And because this is a black grey rather than black, it's like quite a nice tone. It's not, it's not going to um, do that thing where sometimes people get a bit excited about a black, a black wash and splash it all over. I know, I'd have to have a hairdryer, like a micro hairdryer. Like, that would be great, otherwise anything too big. Massive Dyson. You seen those Dyson hairdryers? They're like £350 just for a hairdryer, stupid. People rush out and buy those because it's the must-have thing. Not me, but... Uh, yes, yeah, so then I've got... Um, another colour here, which is this burnt olive green. 
flaps, burnt olive green. There is a blue as well. I've got a black amber, and then there's, I think there's a blue. There's a black gray, which I've used. Blue burned exhaust, which is quite a nice color. I'll show you the blue burned exhaust. It's an interesting one. It's kind of, um, it's like blue with a brown in, basically. Um, blue burned exhaust. These things do take a while to dry as well, so they'll look sort of shiny and you don't really see the result for a while. Yeah, I quite like this blue burned exhaust colour. To, and it's got that bluey tinge, so if I do that around the base, around the back of the hull. That's just bringing in that tone there. It's quite similar to the black grey that I just used. Obviously I don't mind if it's spilling onto the... It's nearly purpley spilling onto the uh, base because I'll tidy that up when I dry brush the base and finish it. I think it's a bit darker than the, the tone on the top, the wash. It's kind of got that purplish exhaust colour to it. And again, it will just take the harshness out of the uh, and washes into the corners of the the legs on there. Oops, might be a bit on the front. It's working. So there it goes. Uh, do that one. This one's drying. This one's drying the. Uh, but it is, you can see how big a brush I'm using to splash that all over. It is a bit scary. Um, like um, obviously I'm been doing this for 25 years or so and uh, you still make mistakes and you like working on things and also on the camera it's a challenge but uh, you're kind of comfortable get a big brush splash this on I know it's not going to ruin it because I know how thin this um, life color stuff is it's not and light it's not like a dark wash that's going to um, you're going to splash it on like a null oil from Games Workshop. Put too much of that on and you'll be going, oh my goodness, all that paint job I've ruined with this kind of super dark wash. Like I said before, it doesn't matter if it goes on the base because that's will be dry brushed up and washed and various other things as well at some point. I did put some on the front of that gun there. And it's, not, it's more interesting than a brown wash. That's also the classic these days because the Army Painter, I mean, I like Army Painter washes, the dark, soft tone, dark tone and things they do. And they do do they do work on lots of sort of rank and file models. And the brown's great for anything. Um, but it also can sometimes make things look like, and I used to say candy apple style. It's like everything's beginning to look like it's been encased in brown sugar and uh, that can happen with the army painter so using these colors which are a bit more interesting sort of purpley smoky color that's it so I've probably put enough of that on you get a little bit more control control with it Yeah, I'm not that happy with the orange stripe. It's okay. I think that could do with a bit of a wash on it as well. Maybe that could take a brown wash. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to let it dry. I'm going to let it dry for now, though. Oh, uh, yeah. They have another good one in this range. Put the top on the other one. Before it spills everywhere. And this I might go on with a finer brush, but uh, they have a black. 
um, a black umber type colour. Um, but they've got two good two good tones which I use quite often, life colour. This one you can even see it because it's spilt out on the pot, which is oil. Um, and it is like an oil, an oil, so we can just get painty hands. I have got a sepia somewhere. Um, I've also got their kind of smoke brown. I've got one of these Ser uh, uh, Seren sepias, Citadel. I'm not a fan of it though. It tends to go on a bit glossy, I'm not a big fan, but then I've got Burnt Umber. Where are you thinking the burnt umber uh, sepia? You're thinking on the turret. If I thin it, and go on sparingly. It's a little bit dark. See what I quite enjoy the fact that you at this stage with these washes you can use quite a big brush and be quite um daring with it really. And this stuff drying ni nice and quick, actually. And it's also drying very matte, which is nice. So the, what was I going to show before I dived onto that? Um, this Payne Grey Liner. Which can be quite dark. Yeah, it's quite a dark one. Now that, if I use a thinner brush on that, I mean, I could go right into, I mean, you could do that sort of grade of painting on there with a, with a liner like that. Again, I think I mentioned before, these aren't showcase, these are bad tabletop standard models, so I don't really need to uh, spend that sort of level of time, but... Um, Certainly, if you wanted to wait, you know, we wanted to spend a lot of time. It's a nice, nice color that pain gray for doing, you know, detailed panel lining, and it's a nice bluish tone. And again, because it's subtle, it's it's you know going into bits and pieces where. Um, It's not ruining anything by doing it, it's just sort of picking out. So that bit was rubbish. Just sort of splashed it all over there. A bit of water to sort of wash it off. This is where I could demonstrate them properly actually. There's the... Um, I don't know what's in it, but there's a remover called um, just remover and I uh, can show it happening because I didn't want to really get so much on this sort of bit on the edge there and you put the remover on it kind of just eats it up probably put too much remover on it's washed all over the place now but yeah it just picks up whatever the wash is and you can push it out of the out of the way As long as it's the life color wash, because it has to be the same brand stuff.
So where am I? Oh, there's the major, there's the, there's the real, if I want some real dark shade, this is black umber. This is the darkest stuff going, and again, you could uh, pull it into some corners and things on there just to sort of bring it out. If you wanted to highlight and emphasize it, a darker patch. Which I'm finding interestingly beforehand I was painting these with in my hand and my hand was uh, beginning to ache after so many such a long time on the on the video but um, put them down on the deck like this and especially with the washings you can go on there quite neatly See, this one's now dried a lot more. It's dried. And um, the, the result is quite refined with these life color washes. And it has done what I said, which is it's given it a, um, a filter. More, more necessarily more than a wash. It's a filter. It's gone over the whole lot, that first coat I put on. And filtered. Yeah, so this is the black, black umber. Someone's commented. Thanks for the stream, Robin. Have to go. Well, thanks for hanging out for so long and chatting. Um, yeah, it's great to have people on. Appreciate the input as well. There is such a thing, of course, of working a painting too much, and that's probably what I'm doing now with these washes. While I'm here, I was going to paint the um, lights on the front. I've also got a fluorescent colour here that I'm going to give it a try, which is a fluorescent colour from Life Colour again. Potentially tidy up a bit more here. Oops. Yes, I hadn't put a white base down on this uh, light bit that I was doing there. 
So you just need to blob on a bit more because if you don't put white down first and you're putting a very light yellow or red or anything on it won't uh, it won't show up. So, you know, they're not finished because I haven't done the bases, but I'm not going to keep streaming now because I've been going on for quite a while. And I'm quite happy the way the life colour um, washes have given them a nice sort of filter effect. And uh, they're looking a little bit more together. So what I'll do is I'll show them up from the side. You can sort of see tone and stuff I'm getting in there. The sort of bluish tinge to the legs up through to the lighter colour and that sort of white gun that I wanted which is for pure sort of sci-fi reasons. I think I might go back and if I can zoom in a bit better there with those. There they are. Go back and clean up the yellow and and um, and wash that yellow as well with a sort of shade like a brown as Craig suggested on the stream and um, and then finally do the bases I might do a couple of other point bits of color like tiny lights on the side panels or something like those little dots and things on the side that I put on there as plastic card I could do them with sort of miniature red lights or something and paint them up with white first and then red just to make them look like, again, sci-fi, even though you wouldn't want a light on showing, blinking out on a battlefield, but uh, uh, unless it was a charge light. Where's the USB cable? The, the droid's just about to uh, power down. Yeah, and the bases need doing as well. And let's say they've just had their prime base color on there and just put an infantry infantry model on there as well so you can sort of see the size of what they're up against or supporting and the sort of thing I'm going to do with the base just a, it's going to have some tufts of grass and bits and pieces on too so that's my hugely long stream done I'm just about to finish and I will switch back to the main uh, camera briefly it is I I'm here up oh, wrong way so thanks for listening in. I've been here an epic long time. It's now 25 past six. I don't know, two hours, is it? Something like that. So it's been quite a long stream. And I uh, really appreciate anybody that's been along for the whole thing. But if you haven't and you've had a chance to watch and you've got any information from it, that's, that's good too. And um, yeah, I'm just busy trying to find where the stop button is for the stream. So thanks again for listening in. A 